It, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to make sure I maximize what is most important to you all. So I'm going to, I have a set agenda that Dr. Dolman gave me to, um, to touch on different data points or different topics, but I want to make sure I touch on whatever is of most interest to you, because I'm, I'm, that's what I only care about is to make sure I uh, do what I can to help you all um, in terms of investing, understanding the markets, whatever, whatever I can uh, assist you with. So uh, let me go ahead and dive into it. And I also would say to you, without question, I'm going to touch on this, of managing other people's money. I've found it doesn't matter how much money you're managing, if you have faces behind it and you have personal relationships behind it, I find that's incredibly um, stressful. So I commend you very much. It's, to me, you know, we, we used to manage a good amount of money, but it was not, you know, I know some people had money in there, but it's less personal touching to you. When you go through periods like we are now with the market's down 10 plus percent, and especially when you own stocks that are, you know, I've, I've owned, uh, fortunate enough, being very sarcastic, owning PayPal and RH and Facebook, and I mean, I can list, uh, there's, another big, um, there's another big one under there, another 50 plus percent or so downturn in the market for these stocks. When you own these stocks, I mean, it takes a toll. You feel it when you're, um, especially you feel it when you know people who are impacted by that, you know, financial hit. So um, that's part of the reason why you diversify. So that way, when you take these type of um, downturns, you can ride through it. But uh, but anyways, I commend you very much for, for, for doing that. And I think it's a lot more difficult than a hedge fund, you know, than a, um, a mutual fund manager making many billions of dollars who it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a big, chunk of money, but they don't have those personal strings attached to it to where it really takes its toll on you. All right. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about myself. That's my least favorite topic, but I, most importantly, I'm, I'm here literally just to help you all. So anyway, I can help you. I don't want it to be a monologue. I want it to be a dialogue, a discussion. So um, I don't know what level in which you are coming into this. So I don't know, you know how advanced you are. So I'm trying to gauge and, and make the best way of, um, of, of you know, making a resonating with you, but also I don't want to come up at a too high level or at a too low level. So please guide me however you can. Uh, I have a ton of slides. I basically do that as a gift. Uh, I don't cover a lot of these, but I just a parting gift in case there's something of interest to you. And I'm obviously happy to forward, to forward you. I've got a lot of other PowerPoint slides, a lot of other data behind it. Um, but one of the things I hope that you will come across by having me here is I just love investing. I mean, to me, it's like, uh, I always say it's like a a desert island experience. If I were only going to pick two or three things in, in the world that I could take with me, there's no question investing um, along with my family and sports and you know, a couple other things would be but would be on that list. But um, investing to me is just a blast. It's not so much fun when you're down 10 plus percent and you own some of these stocks that are getting tattooed, but it's, it is a humbling, intellectually challenging, incredibly fun, um, to, and it's a great window to learn. So hopefully that, that uh, ebullience, that enthusiasm, come across to you, and, and I, I really highly encourage you, if you're interested in this business, it's just an incredibly uh, exciting business. I'm not going to spend much time on my background, but all I'll, I'll say about my background is that I, where my my career kind of took off was, um, uh, and, and you can see again, this, this is going to be the list of things I'm going to try to co cover. I doubt I'll be able to cover it all, but this is, a, and, and please pick and choose. If you want me to cover one thing versus the other, raise your hand and guide me to it. I'm happy to go wherever you all want me to take it. Um, but quickly on my background, what I think is most telling and kind of a lesson I want to always part, especially where you are, where you are in your phase of uh, your career, is my career took a whole different level when my partner and I, we were running a, we were fortunate enough to be analysts on a analyst-run mutual fund. So we were managing 40% of a research fund at, at AIM at that time, AIM Investments. And um, we were able, we, we, we did well and we showed some capabilities, and we also recognized that at that point in time, in the late 90s, AIM Investments did not have a stout, pure, large cap growth fund. And so my partner and I, with a, in retrospect, um, very naive and very fortunate that, that we made it happen, but we had the idea of why don't we produce that product within the AIM fund family. And again, AIM had a large, they had a large mid-cap fund, a small cap fund, but they never had a style pure large cap growth fund. And similar to what happened in the last several years um, in the 2000 and late you know, teens and you know, up until last year, large cap growth was just on fire. And so um, we were missing out on that, on that style pure product. And so we uh, came up with a business plan, took it to our boss, got his approval, and then we were able to put, uh, put it together, take it to the executive board, and they brought out a large cap fund, large cap growth fund that my partner and I uh, managed until we left in 2010. So we, we did that for 10 years. 
But, I, but the reason why I bring that up is if we would have just not kept our head down, continued to work as analysts, I don't know where my career would have ended at AIM or where it would have taken me. But I can tell you, um, being thinking out of the box, seeing an opportunity, going after it, making it happen, it completely just catapulted our career. Because we had now a specific product that we were managing, we were marketing, we were growing, we were bringing revenues into the company, and we had a track record we developed. If we didn't do that, we never, we never would have had that track record. We, I never would have been able to take that with me portably to, to wherever we were to go and the businesses and, and the lessons we learned. So my, my two cents to you all is if you see an opportunity wherever you are, go for it. You know, put, be thoughtful about it, be intentional about it. Uh, worst case scenario is it doesn't work like our, our hedge fund did not work. I learned a ton, a ton in that process. It was a very expensive education, but I am so much better off for having done it. But again, pushing you into the Jeff Bezos looking at life in the inverse. You know, when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to be regretful of things that I did that, I, that didn't work out or things that I didn't try? And there's no question, in my opinion, it's what you didn't try that you're going to be you know, ruined. So uh, use that for what it is. Um, but that, that was definitely a transform transformative experience for my career. So let's, let's shift now to, I think this is where we're starting, on importance of fundamental drivers. And real quickly, and again, uh, John, guide me where you want me to take it. So I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on uh, fundamental analysis. So guide me if you want me to move into other topics, let me know. Who can answer the question, what are the big drivers to stock performance? There are usually three, but there, there are for sure two. What drives stock performance? Well, John, answer just uh, basic financial fundamentals, making sure that there's uh, steady cash flow, um, liquidity within the business. For sure. Well, but if you were going to break that down, so absolutely, 100% correct. But if I were to say to you, you can fill in the blank for two specific characteristics that drive stock prices, what would they be? What you're saying is true, and, that, and it captures all of it, but try to take it even a step further. One of them, maybe I'd suggest, would be leverage, use of leverage. Okay, I would say that is a driver for one of them. I'll, I'll, cut, I'll cut to the chase here. It's earnings and it's valuation. And earnings can be a proxy for revenues, it can be a proxy for cash flow, but it's a it's driving fundamentals, so that's exactly the right answer. Um, and then valuations, what do you pay for it? You know, what's a multiple and or that's a crude way of saying it, a blunt tool, but the, 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 uh, those two ingredients are what drive stock prices. And I'm going to prove that to you in a second. The other thir third ingredient, which May, might be a very large factor going forward in lower prospective returns or dividends. So when you get paid cash flow uh, in a dividend yield, that is also can be, it could be up to 40% over the long term, it's over 40% of returns coming from dividend yields. So revenue growth is the, and this is a slide that shows over longer periods of time, all the way up to 10 years. Over a short term period of time, valuation is, a, is the largest driver of performance. But if you look at the light green, I'm sorry, the dark green and the lesser dark, second darkest green, those are revenue growth and margins. And um, it surprised me, but revenue growth up to 70% of returns based upon revenue growth over a 10-year period of time. So if you get, if you're right on revenue growth, which is not easy, but if you're right on that, then you're a long way toward having successful stock fix. And then just to prove my point, I'll, I'll, I'll really quickly go through this. You can see over long periods of time that blue earnings yield, earnings, um, uh, it's, the, it's, it's basically tracking earnings and then the S&P 500 returns. You can see a very strong correlation between the two. And then this is Goldman Sachs that came out with this just a couple of weeks ago. And it's trying to gauge with the market correction what we can expect going forward. And again, they're looking at earnings growth being one of the biggest drivers our performance over time. They're looking at the, the lighter blue line and looking forward at earnings, suggesting that 2022 earnings went about 225 and then 240 for 2023. And if that's the case, even if the market uh, valuation comes in, so even if the market's willing to pay less uh, for that earnings stream because interest rates go up, which creates a discount rate, which takes valuations down, you still are looking at a nice curve sloping upward, so the market can correct valuation-wise and still be up um, during those periods of time. So another quick point I want to get across, and this is from, anyone heard of a gentleman who runs Fundsmith, Terry Smith? He's a, he's a really, really sharp investor, a great one of, one of my favorite books I've read um, on, on growth investing. And um, these slides really captured my attention. 
and I'm going to be very contradictory. So I'm going to say to you now, valuation matters a lot. But um, I would say, generally speaking, where it matters the most, assuming you are not a value manager. This is a very big uh, caveat. If you're a value manager, then this is not going to really hold. But valuation matters um, mostly when, as long as you just do not dramatically overpay for valuation. And the point being made here is a lot of times what seems cheap on the surface, which can be a lot of the top companies, um, starting price to earnings ratios were, were at this point in time, this is back in the uh, 70s, so this is when the market was giving extremely expensive valuations to companies. So these were relatively much cheaper valuations in the top companies versus the bottom companies. However, what ended up happening was these companies did not produce uh, the kind of growth that the bottom companies did. And you can see over longer periods of time, the performance was uh, opposite of that. These are, these are the expensive companies. And if you overpay dramatically, you're going to end up having, you can see, valuation playing a part. I, I, I'm confusing a couple, I apologize, I've confused a couple of slides. But if you dramatically overpay, I mean, look at these valuations, 85 times future earnings. If you do that, you still made money. 12% per year over 40 years. So even at the 85 times multiple, but you um, underperformed much cheaper companies. So it does matter as long as you don't dramatically overpay. And then other ways of getting that across of overpaying, causing too much damage, causing a lot of damage, is a price to sales ratio of a stock uh, over 10 times. The real cutoff line where it gets really precarious and really dangerous is over 15 times the price to sales ratio. But you can see the market over time, how the real return after inflation up almost 9%. If you dramatically overpaid, you call it about half of that return. So here's a contradictory point. And here again, I'm telling you, I'm showing you signs of how damaging it can be 15 times price to sales, the returns that you have. And by the way, who's been following the market over the last several uh, months? I guess last month or two. What's been getting hurt dramatically in the market? Seems like everything for. for That's not true. Uh, well, I guess I guess relative. So, and everything. Well, if you own an energy stock, that hasn't been hurt. You made money. Tech, tech mostly. And what about tech? Uh, it's, it's that. It's expensive tech. Anything that's expensive. If you were to specifically factor, use your quantitative skills, and just factor the market's return based upon valuation, that's exactly what's happened. The market got expensive, especially in growth companies. Earning interest rates, of, inflation has gone up. Correct. Interest rates have gone up. So, what does that mean for growth stocks? If you're discounting back a higher interest rate, a higher uh, discount rate, that takes down valuations, correct? And so that's exactly what's happened in the marketplace. And you'll, you'd be able to see it almost like, it's almost a, the cheapest companies have done okay. It's the expensive companies that have gotten crushed. And then this is another sign of it, which is this is, everyone loves Microsoft today, but I can tell you having owned that stock for a long time, um, the, uh, the catalyst for that stock actually was when the CEO was replaced. Uh, when Steve Bomber left and such and Adela took over. But you looked at a company where the price to earnings ratio was over 80 times back in the, in the 90s at the bubble that I lived through and I blew up in, my partner. And it made its way from an 80 times forward multiple all the way down to nine times. Nine times. 80 times. 80 uh, multiple to nine times. That is a lot of damage. And you can see how the stock went sideways, literally. Went down for 15 years and it went sideways for a long period of time, it took uh, until 2000, mid 2000s, uh, 15 or something like that, for that stock to reach its all time highs. So think about that. That is a long, painful. And by the way, the NASDAQ went down 80% from top to bottom during that crazy period of time of valuation right here. It got so expensive. Again, a warning about spending too high valuations. Qualcomm was a great, is, is a great company, and they're producing tremendous free cash flow, tremendous revenue growth. Um, and they've done just fine, but the valuation got so expensive that even though, it was, even though the company was a really good company, it got hammered. It was down almost 90% from top to bottom. It's, met, it's made its way back to being an all-time highs, but again, this is 20-something years later. That's a long waiting period. So um, the, I, I guess what I'm trying to drive at is, is valuation is an important component of stock performance, and so is... Um, revenue growth or earnings growth, whatever, whatever proxy you want to use for fundamental drivers. And I always love to look to uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and a lot of the greatest investors of all time. And this is something I always keep, keep in mind. As Charlie Munger says, over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it earns. 
the business earns six percent on capital over forty years, and you hold it for that forty years, you're, you're not going to make much of a di much more uh, much of, of a different return than a six percent return, even if you originally buy a huge discount. So what you're buying, the underlying stream of returns, is what you're basically marrying yourself to for, for performance over the long term. And again, this is the caveat: you don't buy Qualcomm back at any, any, any times a, a litany of stocks that were dramatically overvalued. And I can tell you, having lived through the period, it didn't feel like it was overvalued at the time. Um, that's because um, we were living in a bubble and we didn't realize that it was going to burst, fundamentals were going to implode, and therefore these expensive valuations were have a long, difficult correction ahead of it. So always be aware that you're not dramatically overpaying. And then again, who's followed a, Ro a Roku, Roblox, where there's a number of uh, Shopify, all these companies, are great companies. They're really they're tremendous underlying fundamental companies. But what's happened is their valuations got so expensive that, it's, that they're corrected. And and even though the, the fundamentals are fine, um, and it's no one's fault. It's not management's fault in many cases. It's just that stocks got so far ahead. They were looking out so many years to justify stock prices that it doesn't take much. When things are so expensive, it just doesn't take much to create collapse. You know, it's almost like, um, I was thinking about this the other day, if you're flying in an airplane um, and if something happens to your plane, that's a problem. If something happens to your engines, that's a real problem because you have a long way to go, you don't have much to cushion you on the downside. If you're driving, if you're riding a bike, you know, on the side street going slowly with a helmet and you have a flat tire, you've got a lot of cushion, you got a lot more margin for error. And it feels like those expensive stocks were flying in an airplane, you know, way up without uh, parachutes to get out. And it just doesn't take a lot to create a lot of damage on the downside. And this is just more proof, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is just more proof, again, about beware, though. Fundamentals matter so much. This is contradictory to what I said about valuations before. But these bottom companies um, were considered to be very expensive back in 2015. And they actually ended up being, you know, supposedly going to be 136 times forward estimates for Adobe. Um, Facebook, well, that's had its own set of issues. Actually, all three of these companies have had serious issues. But let's just take Adobe. Adobe was looking at 136 times, but when they actually reported their earnings, they were doing so much better than expected. It was a seven times forward estimate. So they were, so that estimate was was going to be obliterated because they were doing so much better business. And it, you can look at a lot of these companies on the top, and that seemed very cheap on just stale valuation measures: price to earnings, price to sales, uh, however we want to measure it. And these stocks actually dramatically underperformed what they were supposed to return. And so therefore, even though these seemed cheap, they were actually very expensive. So be very careful just looking at stale numbers in terms of uh, blunt numbers to see if, they, if that tells you if a stock is cheap or expensive. And this is just another example of that. L'Oreal, to justify a 7% uh, compounded average growth rate for that company, you could pay up to 281 times for estimates. That's how fast the company grew and how durable that growth rate was. You're going to pay that kind of estimate and still uh, achieve a 7% return. All right, so I'm going to move now to fixed income. Any questions as I very quickly power through that discussion? Yes, please. Um, so what, what, I guess if you had to put it as concisely as possible, which may be hard, um, what, what is the best metric in your opinion on how to tell whether something is, whether stock is like very, price very high? I look at that at a, I look at it at several different ways. That's a great question. Um, but I also always have um, a litmus test of, does this valuation make sense? And I, I've loved a lot of these companies. I've looked at you know, Shopify multiple times. A lot of these companies I've looked at multiple times. And I love the fundamentals. I really do. I think they're just incredible businesses. But at the end of the day, I try to determine, uh, I do a lot of reverse uh, there's software that I have that I subscribe to that does, um, uh, it, it's uh, a great vehicle to give a synopsis of valuation. And one of the ways in which I uh, utilize it is it takes a discounted cash flow measurement and it takes an individual stock price for, for a company and it shows you both on an owner's, or owner's earnings basis, on a free cash flow basis. Um, owner's earnings meaning just taking out uh, working capital and uh, capital expenditures, um, looking at free cash flow. And it basically tells you at, at the stock price where it is, what are the reverse expectations to justify that stock price. So it's a way in which I'm, I'm you're turning the discounted cash flow upside down. It's a way to tell me, you know, for example, a lot of these companies I'll look at, companies I like a lot. Uh, I bought Visa and MasterCard recently. I mean, there's a, a, ton, a, a number of companies. 
But I want to make sure that the underlying reverse discounted cash flow that's being provided by the stock price at the time is reasonable. It makes sense. It's not completely out of touch. That's on an absolute valuation measure. The other ways I look at it on a relative measure. I want to see relative to its history, relative on a you know, price to earnings ratio, a free cash flow yield basis. So the metrics I look at to give me a sense kind of the whole package on valuation. I'm not afraid of buying a stock that is not cheap. I, I'll be, I'll, I have no problem buying high quality at a fair valuation, even paying a little bit higher valuation. I just want to make sure I don't own stuff. I don't buy companies that are too expensive, that egregiously valued. So I, I look at it on multiple different levels, mostly based upon reverse discounted cash flow, as well as some of the relative valuation, including most importantly, and the best relative measure by far is free cash flow yield. If you're going to look at one relative measurement, that's the best one uh, for you. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Would uh, next year's free cash flow yield be a better factor? I, I, I do look forward. I, I, so I agree with you. I look at the next 12 months. So thank you. It's, it's usually because um, I want to know what, uh, and, and obviously I realize that there's a high likelihood that those estimates are going to be wrong, uh, either depending on one way or the other. Uh, if it's a more expensive company, it better be wrong being too low, where they end up beating expectations. But yes, I look I look very much for it. So, for example, I um, I bought a company. I added to my SPGI, which is a which is a great credit uh, rating company. Um, it's in the financial industry. Um, but I'm looking. I bought Chipotle recently. Um, I'm looking for it. So, if I own and I own, for example, a Johnson and Johnson, uh, my valuation that I pay for a Johnson and Johnson is much lower than what I would pay for a much faster Chipotle, a much faster growth company, uh, because you're, you know, back what you're saying, um, if the company can grow much faster and it's durable, that's such a huge part of it. If it's something I have a lot of confidence, there's a long runway ahead for growth, then the valuation looking out a year, even though maybe right now it might seem expensive, when you're growing at 20, 25%, it's, it, it very quickly can grow into that valuation to make valuations seem very, um, reasonable, assuming again that they meet in, and or beat those estimates. So you know, always this business is not looking backwards, it's always looking forward. What's around the corner? What's the market not anticipating? Uh, what's different? And um, so yes, thank you very much for that uh, important point. Okay, any, any other last questions on equities and we'll dive into fixed income for just a minute? Anyone familiar with fixed income? Anyone invest in fixed income? What are, if I were to ask you, so you might not be able to answer the question, but if I'm asking what are the two big drivers for fixed income, any ideas? For, for stocks, it was uh, earnings growth and valuation. For fixed income, it would be, how would you fill in the blanks? Interest rates. Interest rates, for sure, would be a, a proxy for it, for sure, okay. I'm going to re re use a different word for it, but that's, that's basically right. And what happens when interest rates go up? What happens to the value of a fixed income vehicle? Normal. Goes down. down. Goes down. They're inversely related. Thank you. Go ahead. I think I, did you have your hand up? Oh, I was uh, yield to maturity. Yield to maturity. Okay. That's, that's I'll, I'll kind of put that in one bucket, but I uh, don't disagree. Anyone in thoughts? It's, it's basically duration. So how sensitive is a fixed income to interest rate movement? Um, the longer term fixed income, so a 30-year fixed income instrument is going to be, if, if rates go up, what does a 30-year instrument do? Does the price go up or down relative, more or less relative to a 10-year uh, fixed income vehicle? Any ideas? I hope that question makes sense. So the, I'll, I'll answer my own question, um, unless anyone has any, any thought on it. So the longer the duration, so a 30-year fixed income, is, if you're looking at 30 years, that's a long time. And the longer your duration is, the longer you're looking into the future, the more sensitive it is to interest rates. It's no different than a growth stock versus a value stock. One of the reasons why value stocks have done much better as interest rates have risen is, it, is you are not looking for growth stocks. You have to look out Chipotle. You're looking out many years of growth to be discounted back to the, to the present to get paid. You're, look, you're paying much more expensive valuations for durable, longer, faster growth. For value stocks like an energy company, Exxon, like a material company, um, you're getting paid dividends. In the meantime, so your cash flow is coming in quicker, which means in a higher interest rate environment, it's going to do better. So duration risk, when interest rates go down, you want to have the longest duration. So duration is a huge component of fixed income. In fact, 
you can see most all fixed income last year and this year, as rates have risen, have been negative. And then the other aspect of it is credit risk. Who can explain what credit risk is? So, for example, in 2020, during the COVID crisis, when, when uh, oil prices, not $100 where they are, or net 90 is where they are today, but they went in the negative category, what do you think energy fixed income vehicles did? Yeah, crushed. Because everyone was worried that they weren't going to be able to pay their um, promises, their, the debt they owed, because all of a sudden it's hard to make money when you're having to, when, the, when the oil prices are negative. Um, and so it's called credit risk. And it's, you know, it's no different than um, uh, the higher and more secure you are, you're going to get paid your money back, the, you know, the less you have to pay um, to sell your, your bonds. So, for example, if you are a um, uh, I'm trying to think of a very precarious, so, so the more, the, the weaker the company, the higher interest rates they, that they have to pay because why would you want to loan money to a company that you're worried is not going to be around when you get to, when they owe you back your principal? So those are the two factors. It's duration risk, which is driven by inflation, which is driven by interest rates, and then secondly, it's going to be your credit risk. Those, those are the two drivers for fixed income. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, when you think about fixed income versus um, equities, what are the biggest, what I'm trying to for the most part, there are, there are differences to that. A high yield fixed income is more like a stock because they are very, um, in fact, you look at correlations between how fixed income trades, it's going to trade much more like equities than it does like fixed income. So outside of those lower quality, more equity-like products, for municipal bonds, for treasury bonds. Um, for the most part, what's the best case scenario for you if you own those stocks, own those fixed income vehicles? Your best case is you get paid your stuff, you get you paid your principal back, and you get paid whatever promises, coupons, or uh, income that they promised to, to, to um, provide you. Compare that to equities. What are you trying to get when you own an equity vehicle? Trying to make money. I mean, I'm not saying if you own a Philip Morris or Johnson Johnson, perhaps you're trying just to get, you know, your your risk appetite's much smaller, and you're trying to take a nice dividend. So there can be a kind of a closer correlation between some fixed income and some dividend yielding stocks. But for the most part, you're trying to make money, and and so you're much more worried about on the fixed income side. You want to make sure that these companies, since since I'm looking for much lower upside, my eyes for how much I can make on fixed income is much less than what you find in equities. Um, my appetite for risk is, should be much smaller. For the most part, again, I'm, I'm, I'm carving out the higher risk, which can be great capital appreciation vehicles like high yield, uh, low, uh, bank loans, and so forth. But you know, for a treasury bond, for a municipal, you want to get paid your money back and your, and, and your income. So they're very, very difficult vehicles. So you want to be very focused on the balance sheet. Not that's not the case for, for equities, but especially with fixed income, because you want to make sure that you get promises um, brought to you. So when I think about, when I'm investing in fixed income, I'm very, very in tune to uh, what my vision of where interest rates are going to go, which is tied to inflation very much, as well as um, I, I want to make sure my credit is going to be, uh, you know, not uh, deleterious, not degrading. So um, those are the, the elements, and I, and I trade, I usually uh, play in fixed income in a very, very conservative way. And I do that basically through um, mutual funds, closed end funds, and ETFs. Um, but again, I, I, and if you were to ask me today, which is, this is valueless, because I have no ability to forecast the future like anybody else, I think that's an impossible um, capability. But I do think interest rates are, especially what we've seen over inflation in the last you know, year or so, it's hard to believe um, interest rates are going to be going down unless we go into a recession. So I've, I've been for a long period of time, so I've been just dead wrong on this. I think for the long term, interest rates most likely are, are, are going to be going up versus down, which means I want to keep duration which way. If I'm, if I'm concerned about uh, interest rates going up, I want to have my duration exactly shorter. And then the other aspect of it, and I, I don't like to be, um, the, the other aspect of it is I don't, to me, I take enough credit risk by owning stocks. That's not a place that I want to take that kind of risk. So um, 
that's how I think about it. To me, it's a ballast. It's, a, it's an offsetting factor to my equities. I wanted to, you know, when the market's down like it has been the last several weeks, I want my fixed income to kind of play a, a um, controlling, tempering downside for me. Um, but that all being said, I have less than 10% of my assets in fixed income, so I, I think it's a pretty unattractive asset class. Um, any questions on a very, very quick uh, brush on um, fixed income? Please. Uh, it sounds like you are uh, not investing in individual bonds, but you're investing in uh, just like an index, an aggregate index or something like that. So you're exposing yourself to market risk. Correct. As opposed to waiting to get your money back, but you're doing that to basically smooth out the portfolio returns. Absolutely. Because that's what fixed income tends to do. That's exactly it. I do take on the margin some, some I think, for example, emerging market debt's cheap, international market debt's cheap. Um, I've, out, I've outsourced that to really smart active managers who have a great track record. I, I have a lot of conviction in their process. But that's exactly, on the, on the most part, it's munis, it's just safer, exactly, diversifiers for me with a little bit of income production is what I looked at. That's right. Okay, um, I can talk through, spend just a couple minutes, how I think about in, in my process for equities. Is there any place you want me to go to before I just keep marching forward? Is there anything that you want me to touch on, John, uh, topic-wise? You guys dying to know something all of a sudden? I mean, any of the topics which were other people's money, technical analysis, anything else? But otherwise, I'll just, I'll just keep marching forward. Okay, please uh, ask questions as I go. Guide me to what you want. So when I think about, and this is my own process, and this is what I've developed over a long period of time, my sweet spot. And one of the things I always like to say is what, what I, how I invest money is not going to be necessarily the way it resonates for you all. And I can tell you, having lived through anyone, is anyone investing through early 2020? So much in life, when, when things are going astray, when, when things are difficult, you learn so much. And one of the lessons that I have Learned. I, I've, I learned more in the three blow-ups in the stock market, 2000, 2001, 2008, 2009, 2020, than all the other years of investing cumulatively. And it's, I would say in general that's probably a life lesson too because you learn so much when you're challenged, when you're struggling, when you're failing in something, you and your, your back's against the wall, you learn a lot more than when life's easy and things just seem to be going your, your way. And so one of the biggest lessons I learned back in 2020 um, and that's not even talking about 2018, the market went down 20% top to bottom. 2011, the market went down. So there are other smaller periods. But to have the market drop about 35% in six weeks, living through a period where everyone's worried about surviving, literally physically surviving, as we all remember how scary it was health-wise uh, for, for most of us at least. And then you know the economy being on a macro level frozen. You know, someone pressed the button and said, we're, we're stuck, we're taking a timeout, not just in the United States, but globally. And, and the market is just continually going down, and there were so many unknowns. Uh, even Warren Buffett who didn't even put any capital to work during this period of time because the unknowns were so, uh, the, the world was so foggy to him. But you get tested. I mean, I can tell you, if you're picking individual stocks, um, it's easy when the market's going up. It's terrifying when we live through those kind of phases because you don't know, the problem is you don't know when it ends. I can promise you back when the market was down 34, 35%, in, in, in mid-March, no one was going to say, no one was going to ring the bell and say, this is the bottom. You know, this is the time when the market is going to hit the bottom and you want to be investing in the market. It's up 100 and plus percent from here. We were looking through a period of time when unemployment went from three, less than 4% to almost 15%. Um, economic growth was plummeting. Uh, people were dying. People were in the hospital sick. Uh, and people were being treated in campsite and tents outside in New York City. So they didn't have, I mean, it was terrifying to live through. And, um, you get tested, what is your, to, to keep you invested, to keep you from not panicking, being unemotional, you better match up to your investment style to how you're investing money. Because if you don't, you're gonna find out it's hard to hold tight when the world is falling apart and it, it doesn't really match, you know, your conviction's not there because it's just not a, a matching style that the stocks you own. And that, that was another expensive lesson for me because I ended up owning stocks that in retrospect, I recognized that um, during that period of time, I couldn't hold on to. I, I just, I lost too much. I lost, I was very worried that these companies weren't going to make it through. And um, it ended up being very good to me because I ended up um, switching assets into higher quality, great, well-managed companies, steep, you know, large competitive moats at much more discounted prices. So it ended up working out well for me. 
Um, but, it, but the point I'm trying to make is my investment style is not going to be your investment style. You have to have to do the research and figure out what matches and what works for you. And if you don't figure that out, it's going to be a very painful lesson one day when you're investing in these stocks, when you go through a market crisis, you're not going to be able to hang in there. But for me, I, I want to own uh, durable growth companies that have these sustainable competitive moats. And the way to determine a competitive moat, I think one of the best ways is pricing power. Get a company, an airline that raises prices it's going to have a hard time having that stick if everybody else keeps their prices down. If all of a sudden uh, Delta is charging 20% higher than United Airlines, I suspect that's going to be a competitive market share loss for Delta. If uh, when Amazon raises Prime membership, you know, 10, 20%, or Netflix raises their prices, or you know, Costco maybe raises their membership prices, that that's going to stick. People aren't going to rebel against that. that it's a really strong indicator of competitive modes. I want to make sure these companies have, are generating a lot of free cash flow have high returns on invested capital that they're generating and, and, and they have a long way to go. You know, I, I, Costco is a stock I own. I bought it a year or so ago on a big sell-off. I've got lots of confidence that Costco, can, their, their product is going to have tremendous success growing not just in the United States but all over the world. And, and I can see a long way, you know, they offer something very unique that has, um, I think, really strong growth prospects, good, good returning uh, returns that they provide as well. So that's an example of of a kind of company that I, that I like and I look for. And again, that's just my style. I'm going to forego this for the sake of time, but um, I, I spent just a, a little bit of time of kind of taking you through from the start to the end. How do you generate an idea? How do you do the research for it? And um, you know, taking it all the way through to how I, I buy a stock. Um, how do you all, just real quickly, I'm curious, how do you, how do you dr drive new stock ideas? What are some ways in which you generate stock ideas of stocks when the market sold off? How do you know what stocks to look at that might be interesting to you, might be compelling. Statistics class, yes please. I feel like most people disproportionately think of companies that we interact with or like names that are known to us. So, that's how good is that? That's for sure. I think that's, and that's a great way to do it. I mean, there's a great way to get your, keep your hands on the pulse of knowing. Peter Lynch wrote a great book. Anyone read, read, uh, read Peter, anyone know who Peter Lynch is? He was the uh, first manager of, or he was, he probably took mutual funds and, and made them kind of like uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, Michael Jordan with basketball and NBA basketball. He's, uh, Peter Lynch created, he worked at Fidelity Magellan, managed money for, I don't know, 10 to 20 years, incredible returns. He kind of brought mutual funds to, to be, be a great vehicle, unknown vehicle. Uh, he, he wrote a really fun book, a great, great book for, for investors wanting to get in the business called One Up on Wall Street. And that's exactly it. He always talks about um, that some, of the, some of the best ideas. He bought the Gap way back when. It's when his family was buying you know, jeans at the Gap or um, you know, Taco Bell once upon a time, whatever it was. That became a popular you know, place for his family and friends to go eat. So therefore, it became known to him as something of, of interest. So there is a real big advantage that uh, you know, getting your feet wet, understanding and staying on top of um, on these companies. Any other ideas? Yeah, please. Well, back in the trading uh, role, I would listen to the news reports about these companies that were just incredible and how they were just such buy candidates and stuff. And I would sell volatility on those. Absolutely. You can do very well on those. Um, you can also uh, be careful. So you're selling calls or, or selling puts or both? Uh, mostly calls in okay. that kind of environment. So, so that's great. The problem with that, I found, is you can lose out on it. You, know, you can get a call away from you. I, I remember, um, uh, I remember my uh, when I was working back in the, the day for my boss, and we had uh, Nike back in the mid '90s. Was an incredible company. Still is an incredible company. That's actually a great book, Get Red Shoe Dog. And you're just in, that's a, one of my favorite um, business books. Great book by Phil Knight. Um, and he, so we we nailed. Nike early on, and it was having an enormous run. And I remember how excited we were. They had a quarter, and they just blew out the quarter. The stock was uh, halted up uh, the next morning. And then we found out that he had written calls against it. So the whole position was, uh, was pulled away. And so we were like, what did you do? What? What happened? So you got to be careful. So I agree with you. You can create a lot of opportunities, but you don't want to get, uh, you don't want to lose out on long term, big um, returns, compounding returns, uh, trying to make a, you know, a nickel. So, or whatever, whatever the case is. Uh, he was lucky he was covered. Yeah, that's true. 
That's for sure. Um, that's for sure. Um, so the so quantitative tools. I don't need to tell you all the, the value of quantitative analysis. I think if you're wanting to get into this business, the background that you're um, building in a class like this is, is one of the best ways to get into the business. Data analytics is an enormous uh, opportunity set for um, investment management in a whole number of fields. So I commend you all for what you're doing. When I was managing at AIM, our hedge fund, I still do it on a much smaller basis, much less, uh, much more rudimentary basis, but we used a lot of content of screening. I think that's an incredible avenue. And um, one of the things that we did that was somewhat unique was we had failure models. So we had not just buy models, so not just looking at characteristics, which I'm going to show in just a minute, of, um, of stocks that outperform over time, where we back tested these factors um, over decades uh, during, you know, good markets, bad markets, what are the stocks that are coming out of it, does that match our investment style? But, um, but we also had, uh, in some of the characteristics of there, we're going to be earnings growth, price momentum, earnings quality or, or quality profitability measurements, um, uh, uses of capital allocation measurements. And then, so there's on the buy side, we would only, we'd only look to buy stocks that, fall, that, that were coming out of the top 20%, the best 20% uh, of stocks in our universe. And then we also simultaneously ran what we call failure models. What we mean by that is these, there are certain stocks. Stocks have a lot of characteristics that lend themselves to dramatic underperformance. And it's like to, I like to call it, I'm stealing this from, uh, from Bernstein and from empirical research, and they, they, they tend it to be dream stocks. And dream stock is a stock where valuations are, it's every, everyone's dreaming how great this company can be. It can be back in 3D technology uh, many years ago. It can be... Um, in uh, solar energy, um, you know, we all have great dreams, and, I, and some of these dreams will be realized. A perfect example is electric vehicles and Tesla. Uh, Tesla has realized a lot of dreams. They were, you know, their ability to create out of nowhere a new electric vehicle that is the cutting edge, that is revolutionizing the, the car business. Um, but a lot of these companies never, you know, biotech companies are great examples. You know, they're going to solve cancer, they're going to be the you know, ALS, they're going to be a solution to. Unfortunately, a lot of times it just doesn't happen. And you, when, when these companies have very high valuations with basically no cash flow generation, there's certain characteristics that lend themselves to dramatic underperformance. So we also ran um, simultaneous to our buy models, these failure models, and we would never own a company that fell on these, the failure models. To us, they just didn't exist if they fell on these models. Um, and so that was how at the hedge fund is also when we ran our, our mutual fund. We had these quantitative tools that we were extremely disciplined and uh, married to. And again, I had this available to you all to, to get into the weeds, but I mentioned before free cash, free cash flow yield. That is, was our, our biggest valuation tool that we use, and that's because it's the most durable, best, both on good times and bad times for the market. Um, that's where you um, free cash flow yield is, is, is the best vehicle. This is our short, so again, this is just showing what we did on the sell, on the failure models, and that's how we mostly um, had our positions in, uh, on the sell side, on the shorting side. And then this is a, just a combination that shows if I only owned stocks that were the best quantitative stocks, you had a good return. Fundamentally, this is from Bernstein. They did a little bit better than the quant only, but if you combine the two, quantitative analysis with qualitative analysis, you had dramatic outperformance. And that is how I try to manage today, but specifically, for sure, how we managed back when we were, we were running money. So, um, yeah, that's kind of trying to bring that all together, and again, I, I commend you all because where you are, what you, if you're wanting to get into the investment management business, the, the background that you're building, being in this class, building your data, uh, statistical analysis um, infrastructure is going to be very, very beneficial to you. All right, I'm going to forego this for the sake. Home Depot, which is a stock I, I still love, um, and I, I could take you through this, but I'm, I'm probably going to, I'll, I'll circle back if we need to, because I could spend a lot of time on this, kind of how a stock that I bought many years ago and owned, I sold, and then I got back into. Um, but anyone, uh, Home Depot, it's kind of a pertinent topic because Home Depot reported this morning, and it was actually a really good quarter. Um, but the stock was down 7%, and um, I think it's a, a matter of um, expect they, even though they raised dividend, their dividend 15%, they, they grew nicely, same store sales growth was better than expected. The fundamentals were really strong. The guidance they offered was pretty tempered, and that's not unusual for a conservative management team like them, but, but the stock market just does not have a lot of, um, there's not much margin of error today. The market is skittish, 
So if there's anything that they can kind of grab onto on the negative side, there's, it's a bludgeoning that happens in the marketplace. So I, I'll come back to this if we have time and, 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 um, and we want to. But uh, the bottom line for Home Depot is so often what you'll find is what I was saying before is um, stock, uh, this is the earnings curve, earnings per share from 2008 all the way through 2017. And the stock was, was a great winner beforehand. And then great financial crisis hit. And uh, home building and, and money being spent on homes as we had a saturation in the marketplace, housing plummeted, their earnings got clobbered. And the stock got clobbered with it. But look at that nice earnings stream since then. Uh, and they were, they, they, uh, I think they're, I have to look, but I think their uh, earnings are now up to, um, it's nicely above where it is. It's to continue to, and obviously they had a real big benefit last year with um, the, the COVID accelerating the housing cycle. So they, you know, renovations for housing, um, they've been a big, big uh, beneficiary as well as Lowe's um, on the housing um, cycle. But I can come back to that, and there's, there's a lot there about, um, and, and by the way, if you're interested in housing, the biggest, um, if you, the biggest correlator to housing for Home Depot and Lowe's, anyone have any idea what factor, if you're going to say one factor to look at, um, to, to have a sense of what would be the future fundamentals for housing companies, for not, not a Pulte or not a home builders as much as for um, do-it-yourself construction and renovation companies. Anyone have any ideas? Anyone, anyone own a house? If and when you buy a house, once upon a time, you will, you will find, I'm sure Dr. Goldman can uh, attest to this, the first year you buy a house, how expensive, you know, I, I want to change the door, I want to change the, the handle, I, I've got to fix the fence. You just, there's all these things that you spend money on um, that's just natural when you, when you uh, relocate into a house. And um, so the biggest four indicator of, of fundamental prospects for these companies are housing turnovers. The more turnover there is, it's just a fertile ground for a lot of money that's going to be spent on housing. So that's one of the things, if you're going to ever look at Home Depot and Lowe's, that's one I would say to, to most uh, uh, closely focus on. So Domino's, I, I can, uh, Domino's is a stock I bought last year when it sold off. I love the company. Anyone uh, used to buy Domino's pizzas? But their pizzas are so mediocre. Oh, that's not good to hear. My son loves them. What, do you guys like them or different? What do you, yeah. I think they're... Yeah, in the middle. Do you use anyone? Do you, what do you get for pizza delivery if you if you buy pizza? I go on their website. So do you, do you use Domino's? Yeah. Okay. So Domino's to me, I'm glad you that. Although the mediocre part's not good. Um, <laughs> my, my son loves the cheese bread. That's what he he likes that more than the uh, pizza itself. It's not a health play as much as it's a tasting play. But Domino's, I'd say Starbucks are both, both companies I own. Um, I would say they're more technology companies that sell coffee and also pizza. More than anything else, and I was actually this stock was brought to my attention from I, I teach an investment course, and a student gave a pitch on Domino's back in I don't know two or three years ago, and I was wild. I mean, I was just blown away how smart their the companies run, the returns, um, and I, I had been watching the stock for a long period of time. And it was one back to where I couldn't get comfortable with valuation. I thought the valuation was too was too uh, just didn't make sense to me. And then the market corrected. The stock got hurt. Um, they had a quarter that was a little bit disappointing, and I thought it was more of a road bump, more of a not a longer term problem for the company, but more of just uh, post COVID challenges. Um, and but the company was incredibly well positioned to be successful going forward. Anyways, it is a I could spend a lot more time on it, but to me, they sell pizza. They've got an incredible model. Uh, they've got a long, long runway, not just in the United States, but all around the world um, with with uh, selling Domino's Pizza. They're taking a very unexciting category and um, they're able to uh, make it to where um, they can, they have a small amount of market share, they're continuing to gather, gain more market share. Then the technology they gather on you all, just like Netflix. One of the biggest advantages Netflix has is all the information they have on all of you. If you use Netflix, they know what movies you're interested in, they know, you know what you've watched, um, and it's much easier for them to be successful producing a new movie because they have all this data, back to data analytics. They, it's easy for them to understand, you know, so much of the younger generation or whatever it is, what demographic like a thriller movie with whatever it is. So it's much easier for them to produce a, a movie to be successful because of all the data analytics. Someone like Domino's, someone like Starbucks, they have the same kind of incredible technology, data analysis, um, and they end up just selling, you know, 
coffee as well as uh, pizza, uh, but, but tremendous businesses with great returns. Anyways, I, I could spend a lot more time on it, but that's a, a recent example that I put, put down. Um, it gives you a sense of um, how my process works for me, but I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let's, let's dive into anyone. Any questions on that before I move into a quick discussion on technical analysis? Okay. So technical analysis. Um, anyone know what it is and why, is, why does it matter? Any opinion on technical analysis? All right. Let me let me start off by saying so technical analysis is just nothing more than if you look at a chart like this right here. It just takes the stock prices over a period of time. You can look at volumes. If I, I can look at the relative strength, which is how the stocks performed over a 50 midday period of time, 100 day period of time, whatever period of time. There are all sorts of other tools that you can look at. It's nothing more, there's nothing fundamental about this. It's just stock prices that are charted over a period of time. And the reason why it can matter is uh, there's, there's a lot of analysts, a lot of uh, uh, investors who use only technical analysis to pick stocks. So it's more information. Um, and, and, and many times, a chart is a forward indicator. Stocks act in anticipation <clears throat> of uh, fundamentals. So often you'll find um, PayPal, which is a painful experience for me. What ends up happening a lot of times is, or, or, or Facebook or whatever it is, the chart starts turning down. The market starts selling off on individual stock or, or on the overall market. And what happens is the market is telling you something. Because the market is anticipating what's going to happen on fundamentals, and so, um, and just like the bond market is a is a smarter indicator than the stock market, because uh, that's just over time it's historically been the case. That um, a lot of times you'll own a stock and you're like, business seems really good. Uh, I don't understand why this stock is selling off. Why is this stock down as much as it is? And then they'll re report their quarter, and you'll find out that business really slowed. Something you know really bad happened. That that is justifying. You're like, my God, of course. You know, the stock's down 20%. There was no news. And sure enough, they ended up telling us that business was deteriorating. So there's a lot of information that can be told through charts. And if nothing more, it gives you information about what other people are thinking. Because it's all investors together incorporated in a stock chart. So it can provide you information. What's the variant perception? A great example that a company I love um, that's not cheap, but it's, it's, uh, it's corrected quite a bit, is called Kushnar. They are, you all have access to Bloomberg? So it's basically Bloomberg for the real estate business. Uh, Bloomberg's business is incredible. They, uh, they dominate that industry. Uh, CoStar dominates uh, underlying financial information for real estate, for commercial real estate. If I want to know, if I'm a hotel, and I want to know what my, across the street, what they're charging for a room night at the Marriott, uh, you, you go to CoStar. They give you all that information, it's updated. If I want to know office building, all these different areas, and they're now getting into to residential real estate. But it's an incredible business. The stock has been very sick, and they're reporting after hours today. I'm very nervous that the market is telling me that this is going to be a very bad quarter. Um, but technical analysis is what it's told me, and I think expectations are low because the stock has been, you know, it's down 30-something percent from its high. I think there's justification for it because it's an expensive stock. But there's information in the technical analysis. For me, I don't spend a lot of time on it. To me, it's a very marginal tool, but I use it for exit and entry points, for timing tools. I'm interested in buying a stock. I want to know relative strength, because there's, there's information, I think, um, I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but a lot of times stocks will fall back to uh, relative strength lines, which is over a 150-day period of time. Stocks have, you know, have, have um, in the market, and you have all these charting tools that provide it for you, it will fall back to that moving average line. And then a lot of times it will pop up or, pop, or, or fall through. And if it falls through, often that tells you there's a lot more downside until it finds some more support. So to me, it's a tool for timing on the margin, um, but there's information to it. Any other or any questions about that technical analysis? Yeah, please. Do you feel like it's more relevant now that we have like an influx of new investors with these like, stock apps and things like that? That's a good question. I have not seen anything to provide that information to me. I would say another aspect, which is, so the answer is I, I, I have not, there's nothing that's shown me that. Um, I will say that now computers have a much, much bigger role. So data, you know, certain, you'll, you'll find that um, computers trade on 
if a, during a conference call or during a press release it says to tear you know, certain words, it just triggers traumatic activity. So I would think to me that's more of a newer phenomenon. I absolutely believe the volatility, re, all the retail traders from Robinhood and all these, you know, the apps, I think it creates a lot more movement, the parabolic ups and downs. So a lot of these names, these art funds, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Kathy Wood and art funds, but um, and she's, to her credit, she's done a great job, but she, I think, is a, a good proxy for, because if you look at our underlying stocks, so many of these are these meme, you know, meme trades um, type stocks, the AMCs, uh, GameStops, and, and they're just completely divorced from reality. I mean, it's just incredible how different. So on an individual stock basis, you're probably right, uh, but there are probably not, not that many stocks that fall in that category that, you know, the retail is just absolutely having dramatic impacts on. I would say it's more computer driven, more data underlying um, words that are, that are pushing or, or catalysts for stock movement. But I haven't seen anything that, that just falls speculation and, and uh, that's a very interesting question. There's no question how much more involved the retail trader is, how that's going to influence stock performance and stock prices going forward is a very open-ended question and a very interesting one to follow. So I think you're right on that set of questions. Yes, please. Related to that, uh, money is the lifeblood of the stock market, so it's a source of new blood. Absolutely, it is. That's right. Which has to be, the speculating crowd has to always be there. Correct. The concern I have is just like what happened in housing back in 2008, 2009, you had so many investors who, uh, and I'm not trying to say this is a deprecating way, but there's a difference between trading versus investing. And the meme traders, for example, they have, I don't think they, whether AMC is going to have success and high returns on a new movie and or GameStop is going to be successful, whatever their new venture is, they're not, I think what they're interested in is, is owning a stock at 10 and they can sell it at 20 or 30 and, and do it quickly. They're not, the fundamentals are not at all on the radar screen. And the problem you end up having, just like happened in the great financial crisis with housing, is you have a lot of speculators who come in the market and they get burned. They get burned badly, and they then say, this is a big gambling vehicle. I want nothing to do with the stock market ever. Um, and that happened after the Great Depression. So many investors, uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, great and my father, uh, bought into a stock because someone told him that you ought to buy it. He lost all of his money. He never invested another dime in, in, in equities. And you know, that's, and there's so many problems with that. Um, but that's the worry I have, is, is if they own a game stock, you know, it went to 450 bucks. They bought it, you know, who knows what the average price is, and it's probably not even worth $10. And so eventually fundamentals are going to cause the stock price to come back down. Whatever, I, I, I'm, I'm not spending, that's pure speculation. I have no idea on GameStop, but it's hard to believe that that you know, dying physical retail store of gaming um, is, is, is going to justify a very high stock price. So I just worry that the long-term damage it does with a scarring negative experience for some of these plays, these uh, individual company or uh, investors. Okay, shifting to managing other people's money. You might want to do more discussion on this than me because uh, you're doing that more than I am. But uh, I find to be, um, it's, it's, it could be, the, the money management business is a fabulous business. It really, it's incredibly hard to get into. Uh, but it's, it's incredibly enjoyable. I, I've already mentioned humbling, intellectually challenging. But it's also unbelievably stressful. I found, uh, I always used to make the analogy, it's like being a professional you know, baseball coach or an NFL football coach. Every single day, you know if you win or you lose, you know how you're ranking relative to your competitors, you know if you're bringing in assets. Um, and there aren't that many businesses that you can look to. You know, if, if, um, if a new uh, at t you know, if, if a new cell phone gets sold or if a new air conditioning gets sold, you know, is it, is it the, or, you know, Best Buy Geek Squad sells a, a new service. Is it the salesperson? Is it the reputation? You know, how do you designate who is responsible for additional sales. In this business, you are measured every day, and you know exactly where you come in. It's, it's great, but it's also very stressful. Um, and then, you know, when, when you're losing your own money, it hurts. When you're losing, you know, loved ones or friends, I mean, there's a special amount of pain that it, that it creates for you. So, um, and you can also do very, very well financially um, managing other people's money. The, the negatives are, um, you know, managing my own money as opposed to other people's money is opportunity cost. Um, I don't have the same amount of resources that I used to have. I have great resources. I don't have no excuses. I've had more than I ever needed. Um, and then the last thing, you know, being competitive. There's a lot, there is fun when things are going well, not when you're losing, not when you're on a bad streak. 
Uh, but it's a lot of fun, and the competition of being measured every day. Um, but they're very, very different animals. Ma measuring, managing other people's money versus um, not. They're very, very different experiences. Shifting to another considerations as as having been a fund manager, managing uh, investment, you know, investment vehicles such as mutual funds. Things that you might not know about um, as a layperson, and in their real world situations, and, and that is. Um, a lot of portfolio managers, if you ask a large cap growth manager, do you like Apple, do you like Amazon or Netflix or whatever, or um, uh, Alphabet, and they might say, you know, Apple I think is just too expensive. And then, and then you'll ask, you know, do you own any for your fund? Yeah, I own three and a half percent. And so you, you know, you have to be scratching your head for most people say, my gosh, you don't like the company, you think it's too expensive, yet you own three, four percent. And they'll say, yeah, but I'm relatively half weight versus the index of my competitors. The average competitor in large cap growth owns 7 or 8%. The index owns 7 or 8%. So I'm actually 50% underweight by owning 3.5%, 4%. And so, you know, again, there's a, the absolute dollars are, if, the money, if they think the stock is going to underperform and go down, yet they have 3.5%, 4%, you're making a negative statement. And so, again, that's just not something that's natural for, for lay people to think about. But so much of, we, I used to get measured when I looked at AIM, my, my, um, uh, how I got paid was based upon um, mostly how did I, how did I um, perform relative to my asset class. So if, if the, and I was measured against the Russell 1000 growth index and my large cap growth competitors, but three, 400 competitors at the time. So if the market back in 2008, it's even ridiculous for me to say that, we had a relatively good year. We lost, I think, four or five percentage points less than our competitors in our index. So, you know, we lost 20-ish percent, something like that, which means, you know, you're at $100 with us, you have $80 now, and we actually were being commended, praised, because we lost less money. Um, you can't pay for rent, you can't go buy groceries with less loss than, um, than you would, you know, but that's the reality of, of being a fund manager. It's all, for the most part, hedge funds are different, but it's all a relative game versus the index versus the competitors. Um, you know, how I think about these things now is, um, and there are different ways to think about how to um, manage through losses. I mentioned before being fully diversified. I can't stress to you enough. Um, I think diversification is an absolute requirement to live through difficult times like we had the last, uh, you know, last month and a half. Um, I'd rather, and, and from my perspective, I would rather, my biggest position size, which is somewhat big, I mean, I, my top 10 holdings are about a third of my portfolio, so that's reasonable concentration. My biggest position is six and a half percent or so. Um, but um, for the most part, I, rather, I, own a lot of, I own a lot of small positions. Again, I'd rather over diversify. You're not going to get wealthy owning a lot of small positions for the most part. Where you really are going to grow your nest egg is being right and being diversified. But when you do that, you're taking the risk if you're wrong, the damage can be dramatic. If Meta or Facebook is down 40, about 40% in the last um, uh, few months. Uh, Facebook was not an expensive stock before it collapsed 40%. It fell 25% after its earnings uh, period. It was a pretty cheap company prior to the 25% downdraft. So valuation alone will not necessarily protect you from, from, um, from damage. What protects you is diversification. But the other side of that coin is you can't make up a ton of money if you're overly diversified. I'm more attuned to losing money, the risk side, than I am on, on the upside. But again, that's something that you have to decide as an investor. There's a, um, and I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, some great investors such as uh, Stanley Drunkenmiller, who I'm gonna give a very different perspective how he thinks about position sizes and losses and, and uh, making money. But when I think about position sizes, um, I own a, you know, over 120 holdings. Um, I add, you know, to me it's all based upon individual stock. You know, what's the risk reward opportunity Present, present in each individual holding. And so, you know, the companies that I've been owning or buying, um, you know, obviously to me, um, I just think that, I, I think Amazon is one of my favorite companies. My, I, 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 um, my son owns it, he has one stock. Um, I would say either that or Alphabet are my two favorites. But at Amazon, I would say, if you're looking to hold for the next 10 years, that's what I would own. However, I've said that for a while, until the last year and a half, it's gone nothing but sideways, so it hasn't worked. But anyways, all these companies that I've been recently adding to, on an individual bottom-up, one-by-one basis, I feel really good about the underlying prospect at the valuation I'm paying. Um, 
in the same a couple stocks that I recently bought. Again, it's all on individual stock basis. I'm not making this big macro call where I think we're going to have a war and, and, and the geopolitical challenges, inflation is going to come down, and therefore I want to own semiconductors, and therefore it's all on an individual company basis. I think Chipotle's got a great model, a great business, and I think the valuation became relatively, became attractive. It certainly became not expensive um, over the last uh, few months. And I therefore, we'll have about five minutes. Okay, just saying. So I will, um, thank you. Um, so anyway, so I'll tell, all of it's based on an individual stock-by-stock -stock basis. So this is a counter to what I commented about. Stanley Drunkenmiller would say, you want to, um, diversification is a bunch of garbage. You want to have high conviction on a trade, and you want to go for the juggler. You want to, um, you know, he calls it, you know, being pretty selfish, and uh, you want to use huge leverage and, and find those opportunities and go for it. And that's the caveat to Stanley Drunkenmiller. This is a great company once upon a time, and the stock uh, took down. This, it's a really good mutual fund family. They had an enormous position in this company, and it, uh, it did dramatic damage because they, had, they were so overweight. Um, let me see here. I've got just a handful of comments, but I, any questions in the meantime? Five minutes. If not, I'll just, I'll just keep going through. Um, a couple of thoughts to, um, I, I think I covered most of that. So a couple of thoughts, and these are kind of bigger, kind of zooming up a little bit. Thoughts to consider as you're picking stocks. Uh, I already mentioned this to you before. You, know, you gotta know your North Star. You gotta know who you are as an investor. You gotta make sure you align your stock positioning, how you own companies based upon the style in which you're, you're owning these companies. Um, I already made a comment about that. And these are some broader things to think about uh, that I think if you're going to be a stock picker, uh, which is hard, most people shouldn't do it. I love it. Um, it's kind of, you know, I, I do it even if, it, if I weren't adding value, I would still do it because I just enjoy it so much. Um, but most people would be just fine owning index funds, diversifying, dollar cost averaging in over time, focusing on making sure they're low cost, uh, and you will be more than satisfied. You'll have great long term success. If you are going to pick stocks, these are some characteristics I think that are absolutely essential to, to have a chance to succeed. You got to stay emotional. If you're if you know, it's drinking and driving, picking stocks during uh, emotional periods, they're just bad combinations. Um, you're panicking and you're selling at, at bottoms. You're buying at tops. Um, and time and time again, we've proven this. So you, you got to make sure you can put yourself in a position where you can stay emotional. That can be if you're a value manager, determining what's the intrinsic value for a company and buying companies that are trading at nice discounts to underlying intrinsic value. It can be using quantitative models to help you. Um, figure out what stocks look attractive. You gotta figure out what's my competitive advantage. Everyone who's buying a stock, that's what the market, the market knows. You know, Facebook right now, anyone who's participating in Facebook knows they are struggling, they're losing market share tic -tac, tic tac They are um, having a challenge as they try to invest all that money in metaverse. I mean, that, that's all, everyone knows that. That's, that's why the stock's down 40%. The bigger question is, what am I seeing that's different than the marketplace What's my competitive advantage? If I'm buying Facebook stock here, what is it that I know that's different than the, than the market? You, you need to you know, figure what that, whatever that is. And it could be a better information advantage, it could be a longer time horizon. Um, but you gotta know what your competitive advantage is. Always know what your risks are for a stock. So uh, you do pre-autopsy pre analysis. If I'm wrong on the stock, it's gonna be because, for Facebook, it's gonna be because the meta doesn't work. It's spending a ton of money on this, it doesn't work, they never make this uh, adaptation to reels or video. They end up continuing to lose market share to TikTok. Uh, they don't grow their user base, and then their business degrades over time. But always think about, where can I lose? What, you know, what could be wrong with this? And then other considerations is, if you're owning, I, if you're owning Apple, you don't need to worry about the iPad. It just doesn't matter. It, you, you figure out what's going to drive the stock price. If you're, if you're talking about Merck, um, they have a great cancer uh, immunological drug, Keytruda. Um, and the success of Merck stock is very much going to be driven by the pipeline, what's going to own research and development, what new drugs they come out with, pharmaceutical drugs, and also this immunological drug for cancer. What other um, successes do they have, not just in breast cancer or skin cancer, but can they do it in lung cancer in other ways? Focus on what's important. Don't focus on iPads for, for um, Apple. Focus on their services, their iPhone growth. That's what's going to be the biggest driver for their stocks. And I know I'm running out of time. I, I said I can't help myself with this free advice. I teach a personal financial planning class. Um, you all, as long as you don't screw it up, 
uh, you should be able to have a very successful nest egg over time to, to have the life that you want to live. And when I say screw it up, it's you know it's it's emotional. Uh, it's tying emotions to decision making where you're buying high and selling low. Um, but use compounding to your advantage if you can just own a low cost index product, diversify globally, um, and continue to invest regardless of what the market does, and just let it go. Let it get out of the way of its compounding, and you guys will be, you all will be in great shape uh, over the long term. I know I'm probably running, I've already expanded my time right now. I'm happy to stay for any questions that you all have, um, but if not, thank you all for uh, allowing me to come and talk to you. Thank you.